the Kenneth Copeland Evangelistic Association, in its outreach to the world, presents the Word of Faith broadcast. It is our prayer that the revelation knowledge and the power of God be manifest in your spirit, soul, and body during the next hour. Now, with the message of Christ for the renewing of your mind, evangelist Kenneth Copeland. Let's have a word of prayer together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the name of Jesus, for the power of the Word of God, and we praise you for the privilege of declaring the Lordship of Jesus Christ, our Savior. We thank you for it, and I ask your blessings on this broadcast by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, amen. On this session of broadcast of the Word of Faith, we've been studying the subject of faith. And tonight, I want us to talk about the walk of faith, the faith walk of a Christian. Now, I want you to open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians, and we'll read there from the fifth chapter, from two different places in the fifth chapter. First of all, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Now, let's read that again. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Now let's read from the 17th verse of the 5th chapter of 2 Corinthians. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ said, Be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We walk by faith and not by sight. The Bible also says that the just shall live by faith. The Christian, in other words, shall be sustained in life by his faith. He should have more confidence in God and in God's Word than any other thing on the earth. He should have more confidence in God's ability to supply than he has in any other system on the earth. He should have more confidence in God's ability to keep him physically, to keep him well, than any other thing on earth. His confidence or his faith should be totally in God. The Bible said, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Therefore, when I get God's Word for it, when I go to His Word and receive unto me personally what His Word says, then there is where I base my faith in God. I see His Word give it to me. I receive it by my faith and there I begin the faith walk. Now let's take an illustration here on what we're talking about. Let's say, for instance, that uh, uh, a man is in need of healing for his body. Now it seems to me like more people stumble over this one thing than, than any other. Uh, it, it seems like people would like to make uh, a God healing a man some far out mysterious thing when really it isn't. Nobody is too surprised that the uh, uh, Ford Motor Company or General Motors or Chrysler, nobody's too surprised that these people can fix automobiles. Nobody really gets too shook when the guy down at the, the dealership can fix the car. Why? Well, after all, he made the car. They made it look like they ought to be able to fix it. Well, then why should it be such a far out thing that God has the ability to take care of my physical body? He made it. He's the man that made it. Looked like he ought to be a pretty good mechanic on what he made. Not only that, he made me in his image. 
God made man in His image. He did not make man to fail. He made man to succeed the way God succeeds. Therefore, if any person on earth, if any person in heaven knows anything about the man and his body, it should be the father of that man and the creator of that body. Is that not right? God created this body with his own hands. The Bible said so. And then he breathed the breath of life into it. <laughs> man, God knows what this thing is all about. So now let's say that a man has need in his body. His physical body has a need, and he's made up his mind, I'm going to walk by faith and not by sight. I'm not going to be moved by what I see. I'm only going to be moved by what I believe, and I believe the Word of God. So now the first thing he should do is go to the Bible. He could turn, for instance, to Matthew 8:17, that said, Himself bore our sicknesses and carried our diseases. Or maybe he would turn to Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, that says, By his stripes we are healed. Or maybe he would turn to 1 Peter 2, 24, that says, By his stripes you were healed. Praise the Lord. So he goes to the Word of God that gives it to him. Maybe he might turn to John 16, 23, where Jesus himself said, In that day you shall ask me nothing, but whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Or maybe he would go to Mark eleven twenty four, 24 that said, Therefore, Jesus is speaking again. He says, Therefore, whatsoever thing you desire when you pray, believe that you receive it and you shall have it. There's that key again. Believe that you receive. Believe. Believe that you receive it and you shall have it. The man that walks by faith is a man that believes he receives. Now, how do you do it? All right, here is the way that you believe you receive. Here is the way that you walk by faith and not by sight. I go to that word. I pray to my Father in heaven in the name of Jesus. That's what Jesus said to do. He said, whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. So I say, my heavenly Father in the name of Jesus. I can see in your word where it says, by his stripes, you were healed. So I believe that. Now I've got two situations on hand. I've got a physical body that says it hurts. I've got a Bible in my hand that says I'm healed. What am I going to do? Am I going to walk by faith or by sight? Or in this case, by feeling. When he said we walk by faith and not by sight, he could, have, or he could have just as easily said, we walk by faith and not by feeling. The five physical senses are the gateway to the physical body. I can feel it, I can see it, I can taste it, I can smell it, and I can hear it. I walk by fi my faith instead of by what I hear. I walk by faith instead of by what I feel. I walk by faith instead of by what I taste, and I walk by faith, you see, by faith, by faith, by faith. All right. Here I have God's Word on one hand that says, by His stripes I'm healed. Here on the other hand, I have a physical body that's declaring to me that it is not healed. Now, if I'm going to side in with that body, if I'm going to side in with this body and side in with that sickness or side in with that fever and go ahead and say, well, I've got the thing. I'm sick. Well, you know what I've done? I've gone crossways of God's Word. His Word says I'm healed. I've gone directly cross-grain of the Bible. I'm walking by the way I feel instead of by faith. Right on the other hand, if I side in with God's Word, now this, this is important, listen to this. If I side in with God's Word, I take God's word for it. I go over on His side. Do you realize that right then I can no longer remain static? I cannot stay in the middle of these two. If I side in with the, with the sickness, I've got to go against God's word. But if I side in with the word of God, brother, I want you to know I've got to go against that sickness. I can't be for God's word in the sickness too. I can't do that. 
You can't be for God's Word and sin at the same time. You can't be for sin and for God at the same time because they are in opposition with one another. Now somebody asked me one time, said, do you believe in doctors? <laughs> Certainly I believe in doctors. Had it been for the doctors, most of the Christians would have died. And so God raised up doctors because really, now isn't that the truth? That's absolutely the truth. All right, but right on the other hand, I am, I'm not medically minded. I'm Word of God minded. I turn to my Bible first, always. Always I go to God. I live and I'm sustained by my faith. I'm not buggy-minded. When I get ready to go someplace, I don't immediately think, well now, who's going to hitch up the buggy? I never think that way. There's not anything wrong with buggies. I believe in buggies. Buggies are great. But I've got a hold of something better. In fact, I fly. <laughs> you know, I mean, flying is just a lot better than buggies, I think. It's, it sure has proved out to be that way in our family. So can you see what I'm, what I'm saying to you? Where is your first thought? That's where your faith is. That's where your faith is. The first thought should be, what does the Word of God say about it? I'm going to walk by faith and not by sight. I'm going to walk according to the counsel of God. And the Bible says in the very first psalm, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. So you'd have to realize that blessed is the man that walks in the counsel of God. Isn't that right? So you see, I go in for God's Word, I immediately, the Word of God immediately puts me against the disease, against the physical part, against whatever my body is saying. So really right then is where you win or you lose. That's when the force of faith comes into play. That's when the power of God becomes available to the man who becomes a believer instead of a doubter. Now, if a man immediately says, well, now, I just wonder whether or not God would, would, would really do this for me. Forget it. Wonder won't get it done. It takes faith to do it. And somebody said, I don't have that kind of faith. Well, that's where you're wrong, too. You do have that kind of faith. Now, this brings up a point that I want to deal with some tonight. We just read from 2 Corinthians 5, 17, any man that is in Christ is a new creature. Now the cross-reference of my Bible says that any man that is in Christ is a new creation. Old things are passed away. And behold, all things have become new, and all things are of God. The most damaging thing to any man's faith is when he does not know what happened to him when he made Jesus Christ the Lord of his life. Many men, many men have the idea that they are just old forgiven sinners. You are not. You were a forgiven sinner. Thank God, because it's a sense you were a sinner. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's a sense you were a sinner. But God did not leave you a sinner. You became a new creature in Christ. And that new creature, God supplied every single thing that new creature needs to be a success both in this life and in the world to come, spiritually, mentally, physically, financially, and socially. All that God agreed to supply for Abraham in the Old Covenant covered his spiritual life, his mental life, his physical life, even his clothes. The children of Israel in, 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 the, in the desert wanderings, their clothes didn't even wear out. He took care of them socially. When great nations would come against them, these great armies would fall at the feet of little villages just because God was in it, brother. Let me tell you something. One man in God is a majority. Did you know that? Brother, that's the truth. 
One man and God is a majority. David proved that. Solomon proved that. Jesus proved that. Peter proved that. John proved that. James proved that. Paul proved that. The Bible proves that. That's what the Bible is, is, is case after case after case where men exercised their faith in God and that man in God was more than enough to take care of the situation. All right, you say, but Brother Copeland, that was provided in the Old Covenant. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. Because the Bible says that, the, that we have a better covenant. And the Apostle Paul said this, I pray that the God of peace sanctify you Holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy, all one piece, spirit and soul and body. 3 John 3, 2, Beloved, I would that you prosper and be in good health even as your soul prospers. Philippians 4, 19, My God shall meet all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. The most damaging thing, I say again, is when a man does not know who he is in God. What has happened to him when he made Jesus Christ Lord of his life? You're a new creature. This says right here in the 21st verse that we read in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, that he who knew no sin was made to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him the righteousness of God. How in the world can you make the righteousness of God sick? Can you really imagine that? Now, now you put yourself in the place of the devil. Jesus is walking the shores of Galilee, and he's walking along here one afternoon, and there's a leper runs up to him and says, I know you can. You can make me whole if you will. And Jesus said, I will. Well, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, by the way. And it was his will to do it. He straightened out the man's thinking in two words. The man said, if you can, he said, I will. Straightened out his thinking, you see. He found out it was the will of God to heal him. But now remember, you're the devil. And you're sitting back over here watching this, and you think, uh-huh, I got him right where I want him. Just the minute he lays his hands on that leprosy, I'm going to get them leprosy germs all over him. I'm going to get him sick. I'm going to get him down with leprosy. They'll put him out there in that colony, and if he tries to get out, they'll stone him. They'll kill him. I've got him right where they want. Now, that's stupid, isn't it? How in the world are you going to give Jesus leprosy? Huh? How's anybody going to make God sick? Well, now, listen to you laugh. I mean, you know, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. What'd that say? For he hath made him to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. Now, I want to read you something from the book of Ephesians. You better get your shouting shoes on, brother, because, man, I'm telling you, this is the greatest thing in the New Testament. <laughs> it's the story of redemption. It's the good news of the Word of God from the second chapter of, of Ephesians. And you hath he quickened or made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin, wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, hath quickened us or made us alive together with Christ. By grace are you saved and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now look at the 10th verse. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. There's that created again, a new creation, created in Christ Jesus. Unto good works, which God hath before ordained or before planned, 
that we should walk in them. Brethren, I want you to know it ought to be just as hard for the devil to put sickness on you as it is Jesus. You've been created in Christ Jesus, made to sit with him in heavenly places. You've been made the righteousness of God. Romans 5, 17 says so. I, maybe we better turn over there and read that. I could quote it to you, but I want you to read it out of your Bible. Those of you in the television audience, you grab your Bible and turn over there with us. Some of you didn't even know it was in your Bible. I want you to realize, while you're turning over there, I'm going to say this to you. I want you to understand that all the way from the book of Acts through the revelation of John, the whole of that part of the New Testament is written to the Christian. It's written to the born-again, spirit-filled believer. It's not written to the world. It's written to the Christian. And when it says we, brother, it means we. It means the Christian, the Christians at Rome, the Christians at Corinth, the Christians at Philippi, the, the Christians right on down the line, the Christians at Ephesus. The Christians, you see, were the ones that the Apostle Paul was writing to. And he was writing instructions on how to walk by faith and not by sight. He was writing instructions to let them know what had happened to them in Christ. He wrote letters to these people to instruct them on how to let the Word of God dwell in them richly and produce the very nature of Christ in them by the Holy Spirit Himself. Now, that's what God revealed to the Apostle Paul, and that's what he was writing. So now, I want you to read this Romans 5, 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one... Well, now, wasn't there enough death to go around? Adam's transgression brought enough death to go around, didn't it? Did you ever know anybody that lived about 2,000 years because he just got cheated out of death? There just wasn't enough death to get him? No, of course not. That's ridiculous too, isn't it? Well, now look what it said. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more than that, much more, much more, more they which receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Brother, I'm not talking about something just to go to church with a couple of three times a month. I'm talking about reigning in life by Jesus Christ. Reigning in life. The Amplified Translation says reigning in life like a king. I like that, man. I don't like to be poor and broke and run down and my heels dragging. I like the knowledge that whatever life throws at me, whatever the devil chunks at me, I reign over it and lord over it with my faith in Jesus Christ. I have been made to sit with him in heavenly places. I'm not exalting myself. I'm not pulling him down to my level. He came down to my level of his own free will. I don't have to drag him down here. He already came, humbled himself, the likeness of a servant, made himself obedient to the cross, and paid the sin price so that I could be made the righteousness of God, so you could be made the righteousness of God. And this turns me on. It's, it's the power of the gospel. It is the power of the Word of God to let you know and to let me know that Calvary provided for you everything you need to be a success, whether it be a successful against a disease or whether it be successful against poverty or whether it be successful against the storms of life or whatever it is, thank God you have enough in Jesus to get you over. Praise the Lord. Man, I am so excited over the Word of God. You, you get to where you just don't want anything else. You just, just want to stay in that, praise the Lord. Folks get excited at ball games. That's all right. That's all right. Not anything wrong with that. I did that a long, long time. But let me tell you something. When I found out what Jesus Christ had done for me and when I found out that it would work for me and that it would work every time I put it to work, and when I found out that the Bible says in the name of Jesus cast out the devil, and when I said go, he had to go, 
And when I found out that my Bible proved to me that I had been made the righteousness of God, and I began to stand for it, I began to stand up for what was mine in Christ, brother, I want you to know I began to want to do nothing but find out more about what he had done for me because I intend to use it. I intend to put it to work. I intend to fight with it, stand for it, live with it, live on it, in it and around it, and any other thing that I can think of that needs results. Let me tell you something. Faith gets results, and results is the name of this game. Now, I don't care if you have 365 church services a year and then some. If it is not getting any results and nobody is being set free from the storms of life, whatever they are, brother, you're wasting your time. You're wasting a lot of money. You've got a big building out there that would hold a lot of grain. Now, forgive me for speaking blunt, but I don't have a whole lot of time to ease up on you. I'm just going to tell you the truth. And if you're not using that big old building but one time a week, that's the most foolish investment I've heard of in my life, and there's not a, there's not a Jew in town that'll go along with you. <laughs> well, they know better than that. They learned it from God. <laughs> if it won't pay off better than that, don't build the thing. Brother, if you will put the Word of God to work in that place and begin to believe for it, you can't keep the thing from operating seven days a week. They'll beat your door down if you can do something about the sickness on his baby. They'll beat your door down if you can do something about the loss of a man's family. They'll beat your door down if you can do something about somebody that's got a needle stuck in their arm and a monkey on their back. I know what I'm talking about. If you can do something about that, they'll look you up, they'll hunt you out, and your telephone number will be on every bulletin board and you're into town and your name will be on the lips of everybody in that city because that man can do something. He knows how to fight the good fight of faith. He knows how to win, man. You go over there, you don't get a lot of double talk, you just get some action. And I've seen some guys that could pray some prayers that theologically they weren't too hot. But brother, the devil sure shook in his boots when they prayed, I'll tell you for sure. I, I heard a man pray one morning I was, when I was in school. He stood up. He was one of the deans of the School of Theology. And I figured when he stood up, I thought, boy, here we go again. We're going to hear another one of those prayers that covers from Genesis to Revolutions and halfway back, and, and he's going to pray all morning long. And you know what he said? He walked up to the front of the stage and he said, God help us, and hushed. And I thought, you know, man, he prayed. <laughs> I, I, any way you want to think of it, hey, I've been prayed for. It worked. Theologically, there was a lot of room for loopholes. But spiritually, it worked. Folks, faith in God will produce results. And victory is the name of the game. Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Now, how would you like somebody to knock on your door one of these mornings and say, say, fella, uh, we found out just kind of by accident that you're the, the first heir to some so-and-so big man down here's whole fortune. And from the, evidently from the way you live, you don't know about it. <laughs> and we've come here with the proper documents to show you what you've inherited. Don't you think it'd kind of set you free? It sure would set you free of a lot of your debts, wouldn't it? You found out all you had to do was write the name on the right check and you had it made. You wouldn't have to go down there and fight for it. You inherited it. Well, let me tell you something. When you made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, heaven has it written in her archives that you became a joint heir with Jesus Christ. And that's what the Bible said. 
Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you. He said, Fear not, little flock, for it gives your father great pleasure to give you the kingdom. Well, if he's given me the kingdom, praise God, I want all of it I can get my hands on. Praise the Lord. I'm tired of this other mess. And if you don't mind, I don't believe I'll wait till I die to get it. <laughs> Not when he said I can have it now. I don't want to wait till then. If I wait till then, I mean, why is it that I would have to exercise my faith over the devil in heaven? He won't be there. Now's when I need the victory. Isn't that right? Now's when I need Calvary. Now is when I needed it. Now is when I needed the cross. And somebody said, well, I'd like to know just exactly what that cross has to do with me. From the second chapter of the book of Acts, right at the beginning, at the day of Pentecost, the beginning of the church of Jesus Christ, the first sermon ever preached publicly in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, in that sermon, the Apostle Peter states that Jesus Christ went to hell and paid the sin price for mankind. Three days and three nights he spent in hell itself paying your price. Well, now, if he paid your price, brother, that means I don't have to pay it. If he paid it for me, I don't have to pay it. It's paid. That debt is taken care of. And he was raised from that place of death and sat at the right hand of the Father, glorified. And when you accepted him as Lord, heaven has it written down that you went to Calvary and paid the price for your sin. He didn't do any of that for himself. He did it for you and he did it for me. Therefore, I want the whole thing. I want acceptance of the whole thing. And anything that's mine that that cross bought and paid for me, I want it operating in my life. I have a right because the Bible says that himself bore my sicknesses and carried my diseases. Then I have a right to divine health and I want every bit of it. When my children get sick, I come against that thing with my faith, with everything I have because I have a right for my family to live in divine health. And if I have a right for it, don't you think I'm going to sit by and let the devil steal it away from me, particularly in my little children? Praise the Lord. Not when Jesus bought and paid for it for me. Somebody said, well, I believe God's going to get some glory out of this sickness. Well, then put your pills down because you're trying to break the glory of God with that medicine. Put it up. I said, well, I believe it's God's will for me to be sick. You just send the doctor away then. You don't have any right to be breaking the will of God, you old ugly thing. <laughs> now you just go on and be sick, and let's bring your children up here and let's pray some cancer on them. I mean, if that's God's will. No, it isn't God's will. God's will hung on that cross. He said in his Bible in the first chapter of Hebrews, God in these last days has spoken to us by his Son. The will of God in motion. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And there he hung on that cross. By his stripes, you were healed. He bore our sicknesses and carried our diseases. It says that, just as plain as you could say it. Well, if he bore it for anybody, he bore it for me. It was God's will to put him there. It's my will to believe it. It's God's will to raise him from the dead. It's my will to accept it and believe for it and take hold of everything that it gives me and thereby walk by faith in Jesus Christ. All right, now then, now that I know who I am, I have a right to this healing that I need. We're back to the man walking by faith. I've gone to the Word of God. I believe. I believe who I am. I don't believe it because I feel it. And most of the time, I don't feel too righteous. Whew. I remember when I first read that, I thought, who, me? <laughs> you know, there's some guys right uh, in the, uh, some parts of the state of Texas that don't believe I'm too righteous either. Whew. 
man alive after the way I lived before I got a hold of God. In fact, over the other day in Dallas, I was at Love Field fixing to leave town on the airplane, and a friend of mine was with me. In fact, he's in the studio audience here tonight. And when, when, when I put the, the check that said Kenneth Copeland Evangelistic Association over on the counter, you know, to buy the airplane ticket, the guy looked at it, and he stood back a minute, and he looked at me. He, he said, uh, Evangelistic Association. And I said, yeah, you know. He said, uh, he turned around to the other guy, and he said, uh, are you with him? He said, yeah. He said, uh, do you know about him? <laughs> he kind of smiled. He said, yeah, I know all about him. He said, you're not telling me anything new. He said, I know something about him you don't know. 1962, November the 2nd, I made Jesus Christ the Lord of my life. He got me out of the gutter. He got me out of the joints. He got me out of the fight. He got me off of the booze. He got me off of the junk. He got me out of all that mess, straightened me up, made me brand new, and said that he cast that sin as far as the east from the west and would remember it no more. And I began to find out that I, in the eyes of God, had been made the righteousness of God. He had given it to me, and I believe it. I don't feel like it a whole lot of the time, but I believe it anyway. He gave it to me. Don't mind me if I just get completely excited, because, brother, I remember what it used to be like on the way to hell. I remember what it was like in my bed at night when nothing would work, and I'd cry myself to sleep, and I'd cry myself awake in the morning because there was something going on in here that I couldn't make it stop. And I knew that I had to spend one more miserable day at failure. And I failed, and I failed, and I failed, and I failed. And then I failed at failing. I remember what that was like. I remember what it was like to, to, to preciously guard my sick leave because I knew I'd need it. I knew what it was like to have to just walk like you're walking on eggs because I was afraid some of the family would get sick and I knew if they were sick one day it would wipe me out financially and did more than once. I'll tell you something. The reason I get excited, brothers, is because I found out what it's like to live the last almost 10 years now without having to spend a quarter on that kind of stuff. And I don't care what happens to me. I've been in some jams that have been Fine jams, I'm not kidding you, but I called on God and he reached his big powerful word in there and got me out, praise the Lord. Television or no television, I'm so excited right now anything could happen. I like this. It works. It'll work for the black man, the white man, the yellow man, the brown man, and the red man. It'll work in the United States, and it'll work in Canada. It'll work in Mexico. It'll work in Jamaica. I know I've tried it. It'll, it'll work all over the world. And I'll tell you something else. There's somebody somewhere in every nation on earth right this minute that's working it. God's got a representative in every nation and every, every race of every man on earth right now believing in Jesus Christ and has his mind made up and his jaw set that he's going to walk by faith and not by sight. He reads it in the Word. He believes what it says and then he begins that faith walk. Father, I believe that I receive it. Your Word gives it to me and in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I come against this sickness. I come against this poverty. I come against this situation that I've found in your word. I've got the answer on it. And I come against you in the name of Jesus. Now you get out of my life. From that moment on, he must begin to talk his faith. He must begin to think his faith. He must begin to walk that faith and not what he feels, not what he sees, not what he hears, because he'll hear everything but faith. He'll hear disease. He'll hear the bad news all the way around him. I'll guarantee you Satan will see to it that he gets some bad news. I read in the Bible one day here that, uh, you know, that you're supposed to love your brother and you're supposed to believe the best out of him and you're not supposed to believe the worst and that love bears up under everything and love doesn't fail, First Corinthians 13 chapter. And I said, you know, I believe I'm going to do that. 
I, I believe man ought to do that. And so I started that. And that day, if I heard one, I heard 25 foul stories about people that I knew personally and knew well. People just took it upon themselves to call me on the telephone. You know what happened to so and so. Here they went. Hadn't thought of me in months, but that particular day, they just got to call me and tell me how lousy the world is. That's the day I decided I was going to, you know, believe the best about everybody. Well, Jesus said it in his word. He said, when the sower sows the word, Satan cometh immediately to take that word out. But that doesn't mean he can get it. That does not mean he can have it. I begin my faith walk, and I will not relent on the prayer that I prayed. Say, so, well, what if God didn't hear you? Well, the Bible is very clear concerning that. It was the name of Jesus that got the ear of God. It was not my conduct. It was not my great feats or my little bitty feats. It was not my ability or lack of it that got the ear of God. It was the name of Jesus. That's what gets the ear of God. And Jesus said, whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he'll give it you. So I have asked, therefore I will not relent upon it. I might have said, well, now God might say no. Well, now you can believe that if you want to. But then right on the other hand, that's a 50-50 operation. He might say yes. See how silly that is? As long as you believe in a might, why don't you believe a good one? <laughs> You're believing something anyway. You might as well believe for yourself. Isn't that right? All right, let's go to the Word and find out if he might say no or he might not say no. You can find it over in 1 John. It's written there very clearly just exactly what he'll do. You know, I'm surprised at, at Christian people. When it comes to things that belong to them spiritually, they won't fight for them, and they'll believe everything in the world against themselves. But when it comes to anything else, my, I'll tell you, they'll fight for that. If you have a car out here and somebody's stealing the tires off of it, would you just stand back there and say, well, it must be God's will. <laughs> if you had an automobile for sale and somebody come along and offered you your price, you'd take it. But if he didn't offer you your price, well, no, I know what I want for that car. I'm not going to take less than that. But then write it on the same hand, something will come up in the Bible, and you'll read that and say, well, I don't, I don't believe God wanted me to have that. Well, then he ought not sent Jesus to the cross if he didn't want me to have it. If he did not want you to have what Calvary provides, then God has been partaker in a murder. If he cut out any man, if he cut out any man and said, no, Calvary is not for you, then God is a murderer. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Life, man, life. Life. Not part life and part death, but everlasting life. I like it. Life. Live alive turns me on this jesus this holy spirit this god this holy father this word that would come and tell me in first john the fifth chapter in the 14th verse this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will well all right we started off according to his will because we went to the word first to get it didn't we Remember that? His word is his will. A man can't will one thing and say something else in his word. I mean, he can't give his word and will something else. One or the other of them has got to be a lie. His will and his word are the same. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Thank God he hears it. Thank God he answers it. Thank God it's mine, and I'm going to fight the devil and anybody else that tries to take it away from me. It's mine. Jesus bought and paid for it for me, gave it to me free-heartedly of his own free will. So praise the Lord, it's mine. It is mine. It's yours. 
Anything that belongs to Christ belongs to you and belongs to me because I'm his joint heir. I'm not a sub heir. It says I'm a joint heir. Now Galatians 4, 7 says you're no longer servants but sons, sons of God, heirs of Almighty God. Can you fathom that? Being an heir of God, when you do fathom it, when you begin to believe it, when you begin to put confidence in it, there's just something that will well up down on the inside of you so strong and so powerful that you no longer will sit by and let Satan or anybody else just roll roughshod over you. And somebody always wants to say that healing's passed away. Well, if it did, Jesus would have had to pass away because he's the healer. Somebody wants to say that, that this passed away or that passed away. Jesus said heaven and earth pass away, but my word won't. So thank God it's mine. Another man would say, well, I believe God will heal a few folks sometime. Well, if he's only going to heal one man in the 20th century, it's going to be me. <laughs> I'm the one. Thank you. Sorry about you fellas. I'm it. <laughs> Why? Because his word says it, and I believe his word. See? Well, now then, right on the other hand, that turns right around and he says he's no respecter of persons. Well, that means he's not going to just heal one man in the 20th century. He'll heal anybody believe for it. Why? Because, now listen, this is a key point. Himself bore our sicknesses and carried our diseases is not a promise. He didn't promise to do anything. He's already done it. That is a fact. He's already borne that sickness and carried that disease. He's already paid for your salvation. God, God is not going to have to come down out of heaven to save you. Praise the Lord. All you've got to do is accept it. He already did that. He came out of heaven 1970-some years ago and paid the sin price and hung on that cross so that I can walk this walk of faith. So what have I done? I have found out who I am. I have found out that it belongs to me. I have decided to walk by faith and not by sight. I have decided to believe what God has said. I begin to walk that faith. I begin to talk that faith. If you're going to talk to me about sickness, I'm going to talk to you about healing. If you're going to come talk to me about I don't look too good, in fact, I've had people come up to me and say, my goodness, fella, you sure don't look too good. I said, well, I'm not going by the way I look. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Jesus said in his earthly ministry, I could have what I say, and I'm saying I'm healed. That usually thins out the crowd pretty well right there. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I kicked a great big stool one morning <laughs> on my way to bed. Great huge stool I've got in my den. And I kicked that thing and broke one of my little toes. Oh, man, I never had anything hurt me so bad. And it, uh, what I wanted to tell out of this, I, right then, I went in, got on my knees, I got the Word of God. I almost passed out when I did it. It was hurting me so bad. I did just exactly what I've been telling you. I went to the Word. I found in the Word where it belongs to me. I went to God, declared His Word before Him, thanked Him for it, praised Him for it, and timed it. It was 15 minutes before 2 o'clock in the morning. I said, on this morning, on this day, at 15 minutes to 2, I believe that I receive healing from my foot. I believe that I receive it. It hurt just as bad as it ever did. I got in the bed. The next morning I got up, and the when I, first thing when I opened my eyes, first thing I heard was the devil. It seemed to me like he was just right up there over me, like, just, you know, <laughs> ready to gun me down just a minute on my eyes. said, why don't you step on that foot and see if it's healed? Well, folks, I don't have to see if God's word so. I'm not moved by what I see or by what I feel. I'm moved by what I believe. I said, no, himself bore my sickness, carried my infirmities, and by his stripes I'm healed. I believe that I receive it. I don't believe I receive it this morning. I believed it last night, 15 minutes or two. That's when I grasped it. That's when I took hold of it. It's mine, and you and nobody else going to rob me from it. So I got up. I went out to the airport. I went out there to look at a, a, an airplane, and I there's went into the man's office that was supposed to talk to me about it. 
And when I went in there, he wasn't there. Well, boy, I was I just walking around with my teeth gritted. That foot was hurting so bad, I could hardly stand it. I walked into the office, so the girl was sitting here at the desk. Now, remember, we talked about this on one of our faith sessions. You can have what you say. And I was saying that I was healed. I wasn't saying I hurt. I had to grit my teeth to keep from saying I hurt, but I was saying that I was healed. So I walked up there, and everybody was walking around in there having such a good time, saying good morning, hello, you know, and all of that. I walked up, and I said, boy, about 2 o'clock this morning, a little bit before, I kicked a big old stool in my den, and, and I, ble I, I broke my toe. Oh, they said, really? What happened then? You know, everybody's bloodthirsty. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, everybody wants to talk about the hurt. But right then, I said, but you know, Jesus Christ of Nazareth said in his earthly ministry, whosoever shall say unto that mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He'll have whatsoever he saith. And I say, I believe I receive my healing in 15 minutes or two this morning. And zip, 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 zip. Boy, everybody <laughs> found the door quick. <laughs> And I was standing here, and that girl couldn't get out of that chair. She'd have had to come past me, see? And she's just sitting there saying, oh. <laughs> that cut off the bad news right quick. Before I got off of that airport that day, my foot was all right. Now, you can call me crazy if you want to, brother, but I got the heel foot. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I know you got something out of this session today. Walking by faith and not beside. I've asked... Brother and Sister David Geiger, if they'll come and uh, join me in prayer, if the two of you will come now. And those of you in the television audience, I want to ask you right where you are to believe God together. Come on up here. And let's pray together. This young family lives by faith. I know this family well. In fact, uh, their daddy and mother are the pastor of the church where I, where I attend church and they're strong Christians. You believe with us as we pray and believe God together for whatever your need may be. Our Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the three of us agree together for the needs being met of the people wherever they are and cause them to rise up and begin to walk by faith and not by sight. Jesus, heal the people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now let's walk over here, and as is our custom here on this program, we're going to lay hands on this globe. I'm going to ask the rest of you here in the audience to pray with us as we believe God for the world and the men in it. Our Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we thank you for your power. We thank you for your word, and we pray in behalf of the entire world for revival to sweep this world and get rid of its ills and its cares and its woes and its diseases and its fear. In the name of Jesus we pray and we believe God. Amen. Thank you. Praise the Lord. The walk of faith by the power of God be strong in the Lord, brethren, and the power of His might. This is the key to victorious living. Now, remember what the Bible said. The battle is the Lord's. The victory is ours. The victory is mine. The victory is yours. The battle is the Lord. I'm not moved by what I see. I'm moved only by what I believe. I want you to learn that. I want you to learn to use it in a moment of stress, the moment you see something that's against your faith, the moment that anything strikes your home, the moment that, uh, that onslaught comes. I'm not moved by what I see. I'm moved by what I believe, and I believe God. I believe His Word. I stand for it. I live in it, I love in it, and I pray in it, and I believe for it in Jesus' name. Well, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed bringing this to you, and I, I know you've enjoyed it. I want you to take your Bible 
I want you to study these things and find out for yourself that they are true. And remember this, Jesus is Lord. Thank you. You have been witnessing the ministry of Evangelist Kenneth Copeland. Address all correspondence to the Kenneth Copeland Evangelistic Association, Post Office Box 3407, Fort Worth, Texas, zip code 76105. Remember, Jesus is Lord.